Okay, hello everybody. We're just waiting for everybody to log in. So I'm just going to give it a few more seconds while everybody gets logged in and settles down and then we'll start off our virtual careers day. Okay, it's quite a few people logged in now, so I think we'll get get this event kicked off. Welcome everybody to the Scottish Wildlife Trust Virtual Careers Day. My name is Catherine Ledland and I am the People and Wildlife Officer at the Scottish Wildlife Trust and I will be your host for today's event. We've got a jam-packed afternoon for you. We're going to go through a little bit about the Scottish Wildlife Trust as an organisation and what we do and our key aims and how we achieve those. And then we're going to have a series of presentations for you from staff and volunteers across the trust. And they're going to take you through their roles and how they kind of came to be in those roles, the pathways that they took into them. And you'll find that you'll also pick up some top tips as well for how you could get started on a career in conservation. Now, there'll be a chance to ask questions today. If you hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little questions tab. So you can type your questions in there as the event goes on and we'll answer those in two sessions during today's event. So we're going to have one about halfway through and then we'll have another Q&A at the end of today's event. And you'll find that you can vote for those questions as well. So if you see a question in the tab that you think is a really good question that you'd like to know the answer to, you can give it a thumbs up and we will prioritise the questions with the most votes during those Q&As. There will also be a series of polls popping up during the event, and these will pop up as multiple choice questions. And when they do, just pick your answer to the question, nice, simple question, and it'll disappear off the screen. And then we'll look at the results together and just have a bit of fun with those. So just a couple of housekeeping points before we get started. This event is being recorded, but please don't worry. We're not, you, we can't see you and you're not gonna be recorded on that. It's just so that we can uh, record the day and put it onto YouTube afterwards and that'll mean anybody who's missed out on coming to the event live will be able to watch it and you'll you'll also be able to watch it back so that you can see any questions again that you thought um, you'd like to hear the answer to. So that's why we're recording the event today. Um, as you've got a chance to ask questions and there's a chance to comment on different questions as they appear in the questions tab, please remember to be respectful today. Um, there might be some passionate views coming across and we completely understand that, but just remember to keep your language respectful to the panellists and other attendees. And this event is two hours long, so we will have a little comfort break about halfway through. So if you're starting to get peckish or you need a drink, do not worry because just after the first Q&A, we'll have a little break and you can get sorted and settled again. So I think what I'll do now is I'm going to hand over to our chief exec, Joe Pike, to start us off. Over to you, Joe. Thanks very much, Catherine. And uh, it's a fantastic thing to bring everybody together on Zoom for this virtual careers day today. And thank you all for making the time to come. So I'm the chief executive of the Scottish Wildlife Trust, and I began working for the organisation back in 2010, so quite a long time ago. But I only became the chief executive just under two years ago. And I was thinking earlier this morning about some of the uh, steps that I'd taken on my career journey and, and how I've ended up where I am here. And I think one of the most important things to say is, is what everybody tells you, but it's so true, is to think about what you love doing. But actually, if you'd asked me when I was a teenager about what I loved doing, I probably would have thought, oh, that means I need to think about the subjects that I'm studying and my timetable at school. But actually, what it really means is thinking about whether you love working with people or whether you love solving problems or whether you like encountering new situations and all of those aspects that actually are probably even more important to the job that you do eventually. So that's the first thing to say. And I remember when I was 15, I got an opportunity to do work experience for a month in a local charity and it was in my holidays. Uh, and the only conclusion I came to at the end of that process is that I never wanted to be a boss. Um, and I, I think I came to that conclusion because I realised that if you're a manager, then you can't keep everybody happy all of the time. When the manager walks out of the room, everybody complains about you. So I came away with a slightly uh, negative impression from my first work experience. But then I was counting up this morning, thought, how many charities have I actually had a chance to 
work with or volunteer with and it came to about 15 or 16 and the other thing to say to you is that they were all really really different so I think if there's anything I would recommend it's just talk to as many people as you can and get any opportunities you can to do a little bit of volunteering or work experience but just realize that every organization is different now of course I would say that thinking about working in the environment sector is a great idea and I really really genuinely believe it is but I would also say that wherever you end up working, whether it's in a, um, a big business, whether it's in a, um, an academic institution, whether it's in a shop, wherever you are, actually, you are going to be entering the job market at a time where there is no bigger issue than the environment that we live in. And therefore it's got to be, it's got to be relevant to every single job, anything that you do, and you can be a champion for a healthy natural environment, even if you don't work in the nature conservation sector. So that's that's something that it's probably important to say. Um, so when I, I went off to university and studied a mixture of modern languages and social sciences, and then after that, I, I chose to go and live abroad. And when I lived abroad, I was in the Czech Republic um, and I lived in Prague. And I did some volunteer work there. I was also teaching English as a foreign language. Um, but the first paid job that I got was with a tiny, tiny Czech conservation organization called Children of the Earth that had just started up fairly recently. Um, and I became a fundraiser. It was the first fundraiser they, they'd ever had. And I didn't know anything about fundraising. I don't know why they even appointed me, but it must have been because I was enthusiastic and, and was keen to, to learn. So I went and got myself a book about how you do fundraising. Um, and, and it started from there. And after four years in the Czech Republic, I came back and I lived in London for a little while and worked in other charities um, and eventually moved up to, to Scotland sort of a few years after living in, in London um, and have done a variety of roles. What I would say is it comes back to thinking about what you really love doing and even job titles, just like school subjects, are not themselves rigid and you might find there's more threads that are common between different job titles that sound quite different from each other. Um, but certainly working in the nature conservation sector. Um, in my role, I get an opportunity to do lots of um, things that bring me into contact with interesting people and uh, give me an opportunity to think about how we can all work together and find that common ground to, to tackle the biodiversity crisis that, that we face. Because actually, you've probably all seen from the news coverage that um, you know David Attenborough um, appears in quite frequently now, and, and obviously Greta Thunberg really championing climate change and the ecological crisis. Um, that this is this is a pretty serious situation and, and so we all of all generations need to come together and solve it so I'm really looking forward to the questions later on I'm not going to say much more about my role other than that there's a huge amount of variety I love it uh, I could not recommend it more highly um, and also the people who work in the nature conservation sector I, I can I can say this genuinely um, because I've worked in other sectors within the charity sector as well I, I think there's a, a fantastic spirit where um, it, it's an amazing melting pot of, of different skills and ideas and, and people. So I'm more than happy to answer questions later on, um, but I'm keen for us to, to keep to time. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to let Catherine uh, move us on to the next uh, presenter and I'll, I'll look forward to hearing all of them. So thanks, Catherine. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Joe. What a wonderful way to, to open our event, a fantastic insight into to the world of CEO there and how and the experiences that kind of led up to that that job and yeah as Joe says it's an absolutely wonderful environment to work in the conservation sector um, and that's one of the best things about it. Uh, brilliant what we're going to do now is I'm going to give you a little bit of an insight into the Scottish Wildlife Trust itself so we're going to have a sort of 15 minute little presentation uh, where I give you a bit more info into what we do as an organisation and how we do that and the kind of people that we need to help us to do that as well. So the Scottish Wildlife Trust, what do we actually do? Well, the clue is in our name. Uh, we very much uh, are looking after Scottish wildlife. So that might sound a bit daft, but it's to differentiate the fact that we are not the charities that go out and help maybe injured animals. We're not charities who look after um, pets for example, or stray animals, we're very much looking after wild animals, wild plants um, and wild habitats. So that's what we're after 
doing at the Scottish Wildlife Trust and the other remit is indeed that it needs to be Scottish wildlife so anywhere within Scotland is our remit so it's a nice broad remit um, and that gives us a lot to work with. We achieve that in a number of different ways uh, and those include projects and reserves, education work and campaigning and all of that comes together to help us to protect Scotland's wildlife and we'll take a little look at that just now. So as you can see, we've got an elephant on the screen and this is because often when we talk about conservation or when the media talks about conservation, it's these uh, iconic species from other countries that get mentioned. Animals like elephants, and rhinos, tigers and lions. These are all really important species and they are all threatened and they need conservation efforts and they need protection. But they're not Scottish. You're not gonna find an elephant out in the wild in Scotland and so that's not the kind of animals and wildlife that we work directly with. It's not to say we don't love them, but we don't work directly with those. There is a lot of Scottish wildlife and Scottish animals and plants that also are threatened and that also need this need conservation work. And so we are constantly raising the profile of those species because they need just as much attention as these iconic species that we're all familiar with. So with that in mind, we've got a little ID quiz for you just to get started. So what I'm going to do is go through some pictures of iconic Scottish mammals and see if you know or recognise what they are. And then at the end, we'll have a little poll to see how many of these species you recognise. So I'll give you a few seconds just to have a think. And then I'm just going to tell you the answer. So this one's been on the screen while I've been talking. And it is, of course, a deer. Now you'll get extra points if you manage to spot that it's a red deer. It's our largest of our four species of deer in Scotland. And another bonus points if you know that that's a male deer. So you can tell that from his antlers. And the male uh, red deer have these huge antlers on the top of their heads and they're made of bone, not um, keratin, which is the difference between antlers and horns. And he'll grow those every year. Imagine growing a set of antlers like that from your head every single year. It's absolutely amazing. Beautiful, beautiful species um, and iconic to Scotland. So well done if you got that one right. Here's the next one. And I'm hoping by now you've all got that that is a red fox. And it is, of course, asleep in the daytime because red foxes are nocturnal. Foxes are a wonderful uh, wildlife site and you can spot them in urban areas and the countryside, which makes them quite a familiar sight for us and they bring a lot of joy to people. So look out for foxes. Let's have a look at the next one. This one is a little bit trickier. It's probably the trickiest of the six I've got for you. Now, often younger kids, when we do this presentation, tell me it's a meerkat. So I understand if some of you think it's a meerkat, but it isn't because we're looking for Scottish species. So I'm going to tell you the answer now. This is a pine martin. OK, very similar because they're related to uh, ferrets, weasels, stoats. They're in the mustelid family. Uh, but these guys are actually much rarer. So uh, we do have them in the UK. We have them in uh, the north of England and also quite a few in Scotland. That's by quite a few, I mean, relative to the whole population, they're still fairly rare, uh, but the numbers are on the increase and they like wooded areas and they are uh, usually found out up and about in the trees. They'll eat all sorts of things like birds, eggs and berries and even take the odd grey squirrel or two. But I will say no more about that for now. See if you know who this one is. Nice marine animal for you. So I'm hoping most of you know this is a whale and you get extra points if you manage to spot that this is a humpback whale. OK, and you know that from the long pectoral fins, which are the fins on the side of a whale or a dolphin. And it's got those long white pectoral fins and it uses those to slap against the water and communicate with other whales. So that is a humpback whale. We've been fortunate enough to have those in the Firth of Forth fairly frequently for the past few years. And I know a lot of people from Fife were excited to see uh, a humpback whale called Barney in recent weeks. So um, I'm super jealous of you if you're one of those people. It's always worth looking out over the Firth of Forth. There's all sorts of dolphins and whales at different times of year might come in. So it just goes to show you don't 
need to be anywhere special or fancy in the world. We've got these animals right on our doorstep, just outside Edinburgh and Fife. Now I should find a slightly more conspicuous version of this animal for this quiz, because I think you'll all get this. This is a red squirrel. We get two species in Scotland and it's the red species that na that's native. And again, I'm not going to say any more about that because we've got a bit more information about red squirrels coming up for you. And this is the last one. So hopefully you all recognize this is a badger. And like the fox, it's nocturnal, comes out at night time, a bit more difficult to spot than a fox, but equally happy in urban and rural areas. And they're coming out at night time and they like to eat worms. That's one of their favorite foods, badgers eat loads and loads of worms every night. So that's just six of Scotland's wonderful mammals. Obviously there are loads and loads of other species out there that um, out there that, that we want to protect and that need our protection just as much as the mammals. But uh, we want to make sure that we're protecting them all just like those other species you see on the news. So you'll see a little poll coming up on your screen. Give it a vote. Let's see how many you got right. Uh, the votes are still coming in. Keep voting. Okay, brilliant. Let's have a little look then at the results. You guys did really well. Most of you getting five or six right. That's fantastic. That's really good. That makes me feel happy. That means you know your species and you know what's out there and you can share that information with other people when you're out and about. Knowing about something is the first step to protecting it. So that's brilliant that you recognize those species. Okay, that was just a bit of fun. Let's move on. Um, every organization uh, has a vision and it keeps them on track for what they want to achieve. And this is ours and I'll just quickly read it for you and then I'll explain it. So we want to have a network of healthy, resilient ecosystems supporting expanding communities of native species across large areas of Scotland's land, water and sea. So there's lots of big words in there. Essentially what this means is we want to protect all the wild spaces in Scotland, all the wild life in Scotland, um, and we want to make sure that it is sustainable and can survive into the future. We want to do that in Scotland's land area and also in the marine environment um, and freshwater environments. And we want to protect our native species. So they're the species that have always been part of our fauna and flora. OK, so that's kind of what all of that means all taken together. Um, and some of those words, some of you will be familiar with and some of you won't. And that's OK. We'll explore those as we go on. So we do that, we achieve our vision in three main ways. We champion, we demonstrate, and we inspire. I'm going to have a quick look at what those mean. So we champion for our wildlife. We champion to protect it. And we do that by having specific projects for key species. And one of those key projects is Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels. Now, red squirrels are um, doing all right in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK. We have a fairly big proportion of the population. We've got 75% of the UK's population of red squirrels. But the thing about percentages is 75% of a small number is still a small number. So we still have a lot of work to do to help the red squirrels. And um, you'll be hearing a lot more about that later on from two wonderful members of our Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels team. Essentially, the aim of the project, which is a partnership or a partnership project with lots of other organisations, the aim is to make sure that red squirrels are always a part of Scotland's native wildlife, that we don't lose the red squirrel. That's a big aim. And, and uh, this is a key conservation project for us. If you want to find out more about Saving Scotland's red squirrel, head to their website. I've got the link on the page. Uh, and you can also just Google Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels after this and it'll come up. One fantastic thing about this project is it's really easy to get involved. So you can join in as a volunteer, but you can also join in and contribute by logging a sighting. So any sighting of a red squirrel or a grey squirrel, wherever you are, you can go onto this website and log it. And what happens is all of that information gets collected and contributes to the conservation work that the team is doing for this 
animal. So every little thing helps. It's one way you can directly get involved. We call it citizen science. And as I say, I won't tell you any more about it because you're going to hear about it later on. But I just wanted to mention that as one of our key conservation projects. And another key project that we've been involved with in recent years is the Scottish beaver trial. Now the beaver, I know some of you might be surprised to hear that we have this animal, this beaver in Scotland, but we absolutely do. Um, and it's a wonderful animal for us to have here. Uh, beavers are a native species. They've been part of our, our wildlife um, for a very long time. The problem was that we um, hunted them to extinction in the 16th century. So that's why we've got used to not having them here. They are what we call the keystone species. So they modify the environment quite a lot through their behaviors. They create these wetland areas and those modified landscapes benefit many other species of wildlife. So for that reason, they're called a keystone species um, and we wanted to have them back in Scotland. Now we did that by having a partnership project called the Scottish Beaver Trial, our partners being RZSS and Forestry and Land Scotland. And in 2009, we reintroduced beavers from Norway, the Norwegian population, and we reintroduced them to the west coast of Scotland in a little trial site. And over the years, that trial site was monitored um, and the impacts were monitored and a lot more work was done. Um, and since then, the population has also been reinforced by adding more beavers. And eventually um, it all led, all this hard work and conservation work led to the Scottish beaver being um, given legal protection by the Scottish government in 2019, which is a huge big deal. Like that is a really big deal for Scottish conservation and the conservation of any animal, particularly a mammal. This is a successful reintroduction project of a large mammal. It's absolutely brilliant and a huge success um, a, as a project for us. And here's another picture of some cute beavers because you can never have too many pictures of them. They're just adorable. As well as projects on specific species, we want to have projects that protect our landscapes. And we also want to have these projects so that it brings people closer to wildlife. So our Living Landscapes projects allow us to do that. We have three of them, uh, in Cumbernauld, Edinburgh and Coigac and Assynt. And I would encourage all of you to get involved with those if you're in one of those areas or near one of those areas. There's loads of brilliant work going on. The idea is that uh, each reserve or each uh, park, each area that is good for wildlife is fantastic on its own, but it's even better if we link them all up and connect everything, because essentially what that does is it increases the habitat available for the wildlife and increases the chance that they can thrive. It also means it increases the chance that people have to connect with that wildlife. So that's what our living landscapes are all about and definitely get involved with those if you've got a chance. And as I said at the start, it's not just Scotland's land that we want to look after. We want to make sure we're protecting the marine environment as well. Scotland's got 60% of the UK's seas. It's six times the size of our land area. There's a lot out there for us to protect and the wildlife within them is wonderfully diverse um, and we want to protect it all. On the screen, you can see the world's second largest fish, the basking shark. And we get those in Scottish waters uh, in the summer months, they come to feed. And you can see there that it's got its mouth wide open. These large animals, these huge sharks feed on the smallest organisms in the ocean, plankton. So to do that, they have to sieve the water effectively through their mouths and catch all that plankton. So if we protect the seas, not only will we protect the small things like the plankton, that then has a bonus effect on the whole food chain and we'll keep seeing these wonderful larger animals in our seas as well. We wanna protect the whole thing. As well as all those brilliant projects, another way that we champion for nature is through our important policy work. So we have a series of policies and these set out our stance as an organization and that helps us to work with politicians and members of the public to make sure that we're affecting positive change for wildlife. So whenever you see anything that's about wildlife legislation, wildlife laws and protection, anything about planning permissions for, for projects that might damage the environment, that's all a part of our important policy work. And it's really, really key to protecting wildlife. <clears throat> so we also directly demonstrate, we don't just talk the talk, we walk the walk. 
And one of the ways we do that is we have uh, reserves all across Scotland. We've got 116 of them at the moment, all around Scotland, uh, big and small, they cover an area of around 19,000 hectares. And these are sort of they're protected areas. Wildlife uh, is safe in these areas. You can go and see beautiful things. This is the Isle of Egg on the screen. And you can go here and you can see animals like hen harriers and eagles, loads of insects, beautiful birds. It's just such a wonderful place to visit. But it's not just these um, places on, uh, on islands, on the west coast or out in rural areas. We've got reserves in urban areas like Johnson Terrace Garden in Edinburgh um, and Jupiter Urban Wildlife Centre in Grangemouth. There's loads of places where you can go to and everyone in Scotland is no more than around 10 miles from one of our reserves. So they're brilliant places for you to go and connect with nature as well, which I think after the past year, we can all agree is a really good thing for us. And we like to put our boots on and get dirty and do some practical conservation as well. And this is what you can see on the screen, it's a work party. We have to manage our reserves. We can't just leave them to, to, to be. We have to go and manage those environments. And that might seem a bit odd, but the reason for that is if you just leave wild places, they will just grow into one sort of habitat or a couple of different kinds of habitat. And it will be the species that are really good at growing quickly that tend to do that. So what we have to do is we manage those environments so that we've got different habitats, which will then be good for all sorts of different species. And as a result, we'll have a much healthier ecosystem with lots of different species thriving. So that's what we do. And as you can see, we need quite a few people to help us do that. And often it's volunteers who help make sure we've got the workforce needed to go and do all of that practical work. And the third way that we achieve our vision and all the work that we want to do is we inspire people. If we inspire people so that they know about wildlife, they'll then care about the wildlife. And if you care about something, you want to protect it. So that's the idea behind inspiring people. And we do that through our visitor centers. We have four of these visitor centers around Scotland and you can go and visit these um, and take part in lots of activities to bring you closer to wildlife. It's full, they're full of um, wonderful, knowledgeable staff and volunteers who you can go and ask for information from and they'll happily teach you all about the wildlife that you're seeing on the site. And you can also access resources to help you explore and uh, have some fun wildlife spotting as well. They're just a wonderful place to be around nature and gain new skills and experiences. At the moment, they are closed uh, due to COVID, but it won't be long before we can get up and running again. So once the restrictions are eased, go and give our visitor centers a visit. And another key thing that we do to inspire people is our education work. And um, we have educators all across the trust and you'll see that as people do their presentations later on. And we welcome children from schools and community groups and members of the public to our sites to take part in activities and learn about all the wildlife that they're seeing. It's really important work. Uh, if you don't know about something, how are you ever going to learn to care and protect it? So it's the first step and we absolutely love doing it. We welcome everybody to come and take part in our education sessions. We also communicate, so we put lots of information out there. We have a comms team at the Trust to help us do this. And one thing that we did recently was we created lots of educational videos called Take a Closer Look. And we have around 12 of these videos and we put them out on YouTube. And you can go on to our website or onto YouTube and find these videos. And uh, uh, you'll see our, my wonderful colleagues to teaching you all about different species and habitats and topics, all to do with Scottish wildlife. So they're really, really great fun. Um, and they've helped us engage with lots of people, especially at a time when we were all stuck indoors. It was really nice to still be able to see some wildlife, even if it was on a screen. We also launched the Learning Zone, which is um, a wonderful place where you can go to get ideas for activities. So we have loads of educational resources at the Trust, and this was a way for us to share them with people. And you can go on there and have a go at all sorts of things to help you get a bit more wild and connected to nature. We've got them all searchable and filterable. You can filter them for age and curriculum uh, and activity ideas. So go and have a play on there. You can also now, in the past week, we have launched uh, a little area of the site where you can make your own page and you can um, add your wish list. So you can collect the activities that you want to do and tick them off as you go, which is absolutely brilliant. 
So get involved with that. Go on there and start making your list of activities. Have a go at. Now we couldn't do probably more than half of what we do if we didn't have a wonderful team of volunteers to support us. We have around a thousand or just over a thousand volunteers and they help us with all sorts of things. In this picture, you can see some path laying, some people helping to do survey work. We've got people helping to do work on our uh, visitor centers and our reserves and people helping to uh, run our children's groups. So that's they're playing a game in that picture. All of these volunteers are essential for the work that we do and they're giving us their time, their valuable time and skills for free. And we we just couldn't do what we do without them. They're absolutely invaluable to us as an organization and all conservation organizations need volunteers to do the work that they're doing. And that said, in a nutshell, that is how we achieve what we achieve. But I'm very conscious of the fact that there's so many people I still have not mentioned, and some of those teams are on the screen. So we're all one big team. We're all helping to conserve Scottish wildlife. And these departments are maybe ones that you didn't initially think of, but without them, we absolutely could not do the work that we do. So if you're maybe watching today and thinking of going into one of these areas, um, but wondering whether there would be a place for you in a conservation organisation, I tell you there absolutely would be and you'd be best place for it because every single organisation needs these people. So if you're considering any of these career pathways, there's a place for you in conservation as well. That is the end of my little presentation then about the Scottish Wildlife Trust. If you have any questions at all about the things that I've mentioned there, would you like to know a bit more about anything that I've mentioned? Put your questions into the tab and we will answer those when we get to the Q&A's later on. Okay, I think I'm going to start us off then with our role presentations. You're going to hear from several uh, wonderful people at the Trust um, and we are going to start off with um, Claire. I'm just going to share her presentation for you. There we go, Claire, if you want to start us off with your presentation. Okay, thanks very much, Catherine. Um, so, yep, my name is Claire and I'm the Falkirk Reserves Ranger for the Scottish Wildlife Trust. So um, I take care of five different nature reserves that are all in the Falkirk area. So when you tell people that you're a ranger, often they imagine that you might work somewhere like this. So some were really wild and remote, maybe in the Scottish Highlands, but that's not always the case. And I actually spend most of my time at Jupiter Urban Wildlife Centre, which is a very urban nature reserve in the centre of Grangemouth. So in this next picture, this gives you a bit of an idea of where we've come from. So this picture is of Jupiter before it became a nature reserve. And you can see that it looks quite sad. It's just that a patch of derelict ground and it was abandoned for decades before the trust took it over in the early 90s and developed it into a nature reserve. And in the next picture, you can see how much the site has flourished. And it now is a gorgeous little oasis of green in the middle of Grangemouth. And I really like this picture because you can see just how surrounded we are by urban areas. So in this picture, you can see the M9 motorway running along at the bottom. On the left, all of those buildings are chemical factories. There's a railway line that runs right down the edge of the site. And then on the right hand side, you can see timber yards and houses. So when we say we're urban, we really, really mean it. There's so much um, urban and industrial land surrounding the nature reserve. So over the past 30 odd years that the reserve has been in existence, um, we've created some habitats and let some other habitats just naturally regenerate. And now we have an amazing little mosaic of woodland. We've got ponds, wildflower meadows and gardens. So a fantastic variety of different habitats. And all of those habitats support an amazing variety of wildlife as well. Um, so we have lots of amazing creatures, lots of insects like moths and butterflies, bees and dragonflies. 
Um, we have mammals like foxes and hedgehogs. We've got lots and lots of birds, amphibians like toads and newts as well. So a fantastic variety of different wildlife um, in such a small urban site. So what does being a ranger actually involve? Well, my job is really, really varied. No day is exactly the same. Um, one of the really important tasks that I do is engaging people with what's happening at the nature reserve. Um, and a great way to do this is through our social media channels. So we post regularly on Facebook and Twitter. And when I'm out and about doing wildlife surveys or checking out the nature reserve, I try and take as many pictures as I can because these are great things to share with people on our social media channels um, to just show people what we're up to and what wildlife we've been spotting. So another really important part of my job is education. Um, at Jupiter, because we're in such an urban area, we have a really fantastic opportunity to reach loads and loads of people and get them excited about nature. We think that that's really, really important for people's health um, and mental well-being, and especially when they live in such an urban area and they might ha not have many chances to um, connect with the natural world. So every year we run um, school sessions with thousands of local school pupils. We also do lots of family events as well. And during all of those workshops and sessions, we'll be mostly outdoors doing wildlife discovery activities like pond dipping and mini beast hunting, bird watching. We might do wildlife art and games or bushcraft and den building in the woods. And all of those activities are just really geared towards people having fun, but also learning more about their nature and getting excited about being outdoors. And another really important part of my job is working with volunteers. So we have lots and lots of volunteers at Jupiter, some who help out with our events and our schools, and some who help us to do practical work on the reserve. So it takes a lot of work to look after a nature reserve, as Catherine was saying, um, the habitats need maintained. And at a reserve like Jupiter that gets so many visitors, we've also got lots of gardening work to do. We need to take care of the paths and the car park. So our volunteers are absolutely invaluable for us and they help us achieve so much more than we could on our own. I think that our volunteers get a lot out of coming as well. Um, they love the social aspect and also the chance to get outdoors and be active. Um, and it's just a really, a really friendly, sociable activity um, that everyone can get involved in. Volunteering is really important to me as well because it was my route into conservation work. I started volunteering while I was studying for my degree in zoology and then I did lots more when I graduated and it was just so important for me building up my skills and my knowledge and my confidence and it's got me to where I am today working in a job that I absolutely love. So thank you so much for listening. That was a really whistle-stop tour through my job and there's loads of other parts of my job that I just don't have time to talk about. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, then you can ask them during the question session. Amazing, thank you so much, Claire. And it was lovely to see those pictures, beautiful pictures of Jupiter and all the wildlife there as well, fantastic. Um, next we have up for you, uh, Juliana, who's part of our Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels team. Thank you so much, Catherine. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Thank you. Um, so uh, yes, I'm a community engagement officer with the Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels project. Um, so I'm based in the southwest of Scotland, but the project as a whole is all about um, saving red squirrels across Scotland. And one of the easiest ways we do that is, uh, Catherine, you already said this. Um, so if you do see a red or grey squirrel, just pop it on the website, it's really easy to do, it takes two minutes and you're basically adding your dots to the map uh, and that's how we know uh, where the squirrels are, how they're moving about the landscape and how we can continue to protect red squirrels and make sure they continue to do well in Scotland. In the southwest in particular, um, I look after and support all 11 of our red squirrel networks. They're volunteer red squirrel networks. So uh, each of these carry out a range of different activities on the ground, so conservation on the ground. And these are things like removing greys to allow reds to recolonize, 
doing lots of monitoring and survey work, um, like you see in that feeder box there. And they also used to do um, a lot of public engagement, putting up um, stands and attending shows and fairs, uh, talking about risk rules and raising awareness in the local community. And it's, it's an extremely rewarding job to do because you get to see what the, the work of each of these groups does and how it links up with all the other groups and you get to see their impact on a landscape scale right across the recent Galloway, which is just amazing. Um, but you wouldn't have thought I'd have landed the role uh, back in 2013 because I decided to, to volunteer with the Scottish Wildlife Trust back then. And I thought, yeah, I want to be a species protection volunteer with um, the Osprey project at, at the Loch of the Laos. And I came to writing the application and they asked about skills and I thought, I can use some gardening tools and I'm in the middle of doing a lifeguard course. I put those two down. And obviously I didn't get it because if you think about it, where's, where's any information about ospreys? Where's any information about Scottish wildlife? Uh, can I speak to people? Can I engage with customers and visitors? There's hardly anything there. So it, it was really vague, but um, it highlighted those things that were missing. And after that, I really focused on those in getting experience in those elements to help me later on. So um, I started by volunteering a bit sporadically in, in a wetland reserve in Tuscany, where I was living at the time. And the reserve manager one day just said, how would you feel about going a week uh, out on a remote island and doing some bird ringing? And I thought, bird ringing? I've got no idea what that is. Why would you need to bring birds? Um, is it fun? Who would I be going with? I hardly knew what I was doing, but I said yes anyway. And it turned out to be the most amazing week of my life, which really made me appreciate tiny little birds and wildlife in general and the amazing migration that they, that they go through. And it really fostered a real just love, uh, really, of wildlife for the next few years that really sort of carried me through my choice of studies in university and university and on from there. And um, another piece of advice I would give is it's about what you do in your free time. So use your free time wisely because everybody is either studying or working or has done at some point in their lives. So it's not particularly unique. What makes you you is actually what you do in your free time. So use it wisely. Do something that employees are going to be interested in later on. So for example, I got really into moth ID and identifying bird calls. And I would pop on the train and go up uh, a few minutes up, up the road and go and look, uh, and look, go and visit all my local wildlife trust reserves and practice all my wildlife ID. And another thing I used to do was help out on school and university open days. It's really, really good to do because you can, you can talk about things like, I can speak with people, uh, I can influence, I, I'm convincing, I can do public speaking. All of these things are gonna be really useful later on. So my take home messages are that uh, it's important to dream, that there is no harm in trying, but if that doesn't quite work out, then identify what's missing, hone in your skills, use your free time, get that experience. Because when the right job comes along, then you really have to go for it. When uh, this squirrel job came about, uh, I was really nervous, but when I came to writing down my application, I had two and a half pages worth of experiences that I could talk about. So in, at the end of the day, you've just got to trust yourself and go for it. Thanks a lot. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Juliana. Really, really good advice there, um, particularly about you know, not getting disheartened if an application maybe doesn't go your way, just going and building up your skills and then you'll naturally end up with loads to put on the next application. Absolutely brilliant advice. Um, we had a little poll pop up during that and uh, we can see the results now to have you ever seen a red squirrel and 88% of you have said yes, which is amazing. I'm so happy that so many of you have seen a red squirrel. Uh, next time you see one, you know where you can go to log your sighting. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay, next we have for you Peter. So I'm just going to line up Peter's slide. There we are. Over to you, Peter. 
Okay. Well, hello, I'm, uh, I'm Peter Gilbert, and yes, I'm the Volunteer Development Officer for the Trust. So, uh, I guess it's just a bit of a canter through my life, really. Um, I, I used to did a history degree, and I suppose this is really just a story about, about how you can change your career if you've perhaps uh, gone down the wrong track. So, I, I did a history degree and then went into uh, financial services uh, down in Essex, it was my first job. And uh, I fairly quickly <laughs> decided it wasn't for me. Uh, I mean, really, I, I didn't want to be remembered for a, a life uh, in financial services. I just wanted to do, you know, actually wanted to do something useful uh, to feel that, uh, you know, I'd, I'd made a difference. So I couldn't really think beyond uh, nature conservation as, as what I really wanted to do. So uh, after three years, I gave, I gave it up and went home for a year. And basically, I did some volunteering uh, to get some experience. I uh, I did some research about how to how to make you know how to get into the environment. Uh, so I did a lot of writing up to organisations, and I came across uh, the Scottish Wildlife Trust, who uh, delivered a, a training scheme to to unemployed people. Um, and so in 1991, I I joined the trust as a trainee, uh, and basically I was doing uh, practical work on reserves uh, in the Lodians area. And following on from that, I was lucky enough to get the opportunity to go and do a two year HND in countryside recreation and conservation management uh, in Scotland. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I updated my qualifications, if you like, to something more relevant. Um, and then I was kicking around for a few months after that, uh, not a lot happening. And eventually, a a job opportunity with the Scottish Wildlife Trust came up and I joined the trust in 1994 as a training officer and that was working with the training teams that I'd been a member of uh, just a few years ago, uh, prior to that and I was uh, helping to develop and administer uh, the qualification that uh, trainees did. So I did that for a few years and then I was in HR, the HR department for a, a couple of years, and then I became a conservation teams administrator, again, working with the training teams that I had been with before, but in a much wider role. So I was doing things such as uh, fundraising, uh, I did marketing, I did recruitment, uh, I did, I organized training courses. Uh, and I did a little bit of project management as well, and a whole lot more besides. Um, and then in 2012, I became the volunteer development officer that I am today. And uh, I think as Catherine said, we've, we've got around about a thousand volunteers and you'll have heard, you've already heard about the, the, the importance of volunteering or, or volunteers with the trust. Um, and so my job is to, is to is a lot of processes, procedures. It's looking after the, the, the volunteer program that the trust runs. And I suppose if you had to sum a job up, it's, I think there's five aspects to a successful volunteer program. Uh, and one of those is making sure we have enough volunteers, making sure that volunteers are um, motivated and engaged, uh, making sure that volunteers are kept safe, that the volunteers receive uh, that the volunteer program is well funded and making sure that uh, volunteers feel supported in their role so if we have those five things then we've got in my opinion a, a successful volunteer program um, so well that brings me up to date really so uh, I, I think that again if, if you had to if you had any pearls of wisdom, I suppose uh, one is, you know, it's, it's possible to change career. It, it does take time. It took me four years from, from starting to finishing. Uh, and obviously you're at a young stage in your careers, but uh, my advice would be obviously to study what you find interesting at the moment, because, uh, you know, it's, there's, still, there's still time to change if needs be. And I would also emphasize, I suppose I would, uh, 
about the role of volunteering as well. It, it is it is quite important to enjoy yourself, but you can learn at the same time, and it gives you an uh, it gives you an in into a, an organisation as well. Find out how they work. So that's me. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Peter. That was really, really useful information and advice and absolutely true that if you start off on one career path, it's not the end of the world. I think sometimes at school, it can feel like you've got to make those decisions there and that's going to be you for the rest of your lives. And it, it's good to know that that's not true. If you decide you want to do something else later on, you can and you can switch and you can rebuild your skills and find your way into the career that you want to go into. So absolutely brilliant there. Um, we had a poll pop up during that presentation. Uh, do you like to volunteer? And uh, we can see the results there. 74% of you do like volunteering, which is great because that means you're already out there doing it, which is fab. And a few of you, 26%, uh, don't know yet. And that's absolutely fine. What I would say is give it a go and then you'll find out if you like it or not. So give volunteering a try. It's great fun. Um, all right, fantastic. Thank you very much, Peter. The next person we have to speak to you today is Emma, who's one of our volunteers. So I'll just line that up and there we go. Emma, if you're ready to speak. Thanks, um, Catherine. Thank you. Uh, hey everyone, um, my name's Emma and I'm a volunteer young leader and also a member of council for the Scottish Wildlife Trust. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about my career in conservation so far, uh, my role as a young leader and a little bit about my work with a focus on nature. So firstly I'm going to talk about my career in conservation so far. Um, I started out really not knowing what I wanted to do um, and the one thing I did know was that I'd always loved animals and nature and the environment. And that's why I chose to study zoology at Aberdeen University. And then when I was there, I ended up also doing a master's um, and that was in environmental science. Uh, in my final years of uni, I started volunteering for the RSPB at their Dolphin Watch project in Aberdeen. And that involved pointing out the local bottlenose dolphins in Aberdeen Harbour to members of the public, which was really, really cool. The bottlenose dolphins are absolutely huge and they come in really close to the shore and they're there pretty much every day of the year. So that was a really great experience. Um, and that ended up leading me to Spay Bay, which is a Scottish Wildlife Trust reserve. Um, but I was volunteering full time for eight months at Spay Bay at the Scottish Dolphin Centre. Um, and I was a full time volunteer. I was only able to do this because the charity, um, which was Whale and Dolphin Conservation, covered the food and accommodation costs. Um, and a few people have already highlighted the importance of volunteering. So, um, yeah, just want to point that out as well, um, that it's really important to volunteer to try and get a full time paid job in conservation. Um, so, yeah, the volunteering then led to my first role in conservation, um, and that was six months working for the RSPB at the Lock Garden Osprey Centre in the Cairngorms National Park. Um, that's where this picture on the slide was taken. Um, and this is me holding one of the osprey chicks um, when they were getting ID rings put on their legs. Um, and while I was working for the RSPB, I became really interested in policy um, and managed to get a policy assistant role at Scottish Land and Estates for two years or two and a half years. Um, and then finally, I recently started um, a brand new job um, just a couple of weeks ago, working with whale and dolphin conservation again, um, but this time based up on Orkney. Um, so my job just now is to roll out a citizen science project. It's called Shorewatch um, across Orkney, Shetland and Fair Isle. Um, and it basically means I'm gonna be getting local people from the islands out watching for whales and dolphins um, and recording data. Uh, and that helps whale and dolphin conservation um, protect whales and dolphins and the wider marine environment. So as I said, I am a volunteer young leader for the Trust. Uh, the group was set up in 2018 and it's our role to help the Trust engage with more young people and also ensure young people's voices are kind of represented through the, the work that the Trust does as well. Um, the young leaders are involved in a huge amount of different work. Uh, it's been a really fantastic opportunity. Um, so just to name a few of the different things that we've done in the last two and a half years, um, we helped set up the Conservation Awards, um, and that's a scheme helping young people gain practical work experience in the conservation sector. We held an online climate conversation event, um, and we're currently also planning some policy activity to tie in with the Scottish elections in May. 
And I just finally want to touch on my work with a focus on nature, or I'm going to call it AFON because a focus on nature is quite a mouthful. Um, but I sit on the AFON committee as internal communications officer, and that again is a volunteering position that I have. Um, if you haven't heard of AFON before, we're the UK's Youth Nature Network. Um, and I just wanted to flag this up because we've just launched a brand new careers advice page on the website. Um, and you can find that the website's um, written on the slide there if you want to note that down. Um, but the careers page includes interviews and blog posts from professionals working in a variety of different nature related jobs and um, so they're really interesting to listen to but also wanted to mention that we have a mentoring scheme and um, it is unfortunately only available for people aged 18 and older um, but i thought some people watching today might be 17 or 18 so it's definitely worth checking out the web page and having a look at the mentoring scheme if you are interested in a career in conservation um, you can be paired up with a professional in the field and they can provide you with one-to-one -one advice. Um, we're pretty active on social media and we're also planning to add lots more res resources uh, to the careers page in the future and also trying to develop some more resources for a younger audience as well. So I just wanted to make you all aware of that free resource that is available. And this is my final slide and I thought it might be useful to highlight some of the things that I wish I had known when I was younger and when I was choosing what to study and also when I was progressing through university as well. Um, so firstly, I said, as I said earlier, um, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do um, when I was applying for university. And I think as people have already said in their presentations, you have to try, and out, try out lots of different things to try and figure out what you enjoy, what you're good at. Usually they're the same thing, um, but it is okay not to be sure straight away and it's definitely worth trying out lots of different things until you find out exactly what you want to do. Um, I wish I'd also known the importance of volunteering. It's quite clear from the presentation so far, all of the presentations so far, um, how important volunteering is for a career in conservation. Um, and I started volunteering in my final year of university, uh, but looking back, I wish I'd gotten involved in volunteering way sooner. Um, it's a really great way of gaining experience and skills that you need for a job in conservation. And it's also a really great way of meeting like-minded people. And following on from that, uh, finally, the importance of networking. So building relationships with the people that you work alongside, whether it be university tutors or fellow volunteers, or if you are volunteering, then your volunteer manager. Uh, so three of the people in this picture um, are now my close colleagues in my new job at Will and Dolphin Conservation and all of them that I met when I was volunteering for the charity. So just want to highlight that it's really important to build up those relationships because those are the people who are often very happy to help you um, offer advice and guidance on applications and things like that as well. And thanks for listening. Um, I hope you found the presentation interesting and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Emma. And I just want to say this is Emma's very own photo of a bottle of dolphin here. Very great, good photography skills. Um, key points there about the volunteering and networking, I think, really take home messages. Everybody you meet in this sector, it's a small world and we all know each other. So make those connections, um, keep in touch with people uh, and, and you'll benefit a lot from that. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Emma, and to everybody, all the panellists who have got involved with our first session there today. Um, we're now going to hold our first Q&A session, so I hope you've been sending your questions in. I'm going to hand it over to Jo, who's going to uh, lead us through this Q&A session now for the next 10 or 15 minutes. Thanks very much, Catherine. What brilliant presentations. I really, I really enjoyed those. And we've got some fantastic questions coming in. Um, Really positively, the two top ones are both about volunteering and uh, how can I become a volunteer and where in Scotland can you volunteer um, and how old do you have to be to volunteer? So I'm going to pass that one uh, in a moment to Peter, give him a moment to think about that. Um, the next most popular question is what do you recommend studying at university to go into a career in, in conservation? I'll open that out to all of the panellists so you can have a think about that. Um, the next question is related to that, more specifically um, to becoming a ranger. Are there any specific qualifications that help or support someone to become a ranger? So just let the panel know to think about that. Um, oh, great question about top predators. Uh, links, we will pick that up. Uh, so let's start with those first of all, um, and then we'll, we'll take some others. So Peter, uh, these questions um, about where in Scotland can you volunteer and how old do you have to be? Um, and how can I become a volunteer? Peter, would you like to pick that one up? Uh, 
well, becoming a minority is fairly straightforward uh, in the sense you just, you, many volunteers are asked if they want to volunteer. I think maybe Juliana had that uh, experience, uh, but also uh, you maybe just need to approach organizations and just ask if you want to do it. Um, and obviously websites are a, a good way or maybe social media, you might find out about volunteering opportunities. Um, but even if, even if uh, organizations aren't advertising, there's no, I mean, you can always ask, uh, approach them and say, well, can I, can I help in doing X, Y, or Z? Uh, you never know. Uh, where can you volunteer? Well, that's the, that's the beauty of volunteering is the fact that there's so many great places and great things that you can do as a volunteer. Uh, and, you know, some actually dream, dream volunteering opportunities if, uh, if, you, if you can land them. Uh, so basically all over, I mean, all over Scotland and the islands as well are, are places where there are opportunities. Uh, age, um, it gets a little bit more sticky. Um, in a sense that uh, organizations generally the, the opportunities really are are very open for people over well over 18 is is very open below eight, between 16 and 18 there might be less opportunities and under 16 it does get a bit uh, uh, you know a little bit restricted within within the trust for example uh, you know there's there's wildlife watch uh, that you know that's an opportunity to to, to to be part of, uh, you know, to experience nature. Uh, and we do take uh, school placements. Uh, so, you know, you can volunteer with us uh, through, through a school, but it's, it normally has to be set up as a, as a placement. Uh, and in other, in other areas, we, you know, we're quite happy to take volunteers uh, under the age of 16, but at the moment uh, we're asking for, uh, for, Either parents or or responsible adults to be to be with you at the time of volunteering. No, thank thank that's you. Very much. Short, yeah. No, thanks very much, Peter. And I think that's good advice to look online and approach organisations individually. But there are also certain uh, websites that will collect volunteering opportunities. I can't remember the name of the SCVO website, but I'm sure we could look that up and post that in the the chat. Uh, there's another one called Charity Job. Um, even if you can't find a volunteering opportunity in the nature conservation sector, you can probably still gain useful skills that would transfer across. I did notice that one person had mentioned it's really difficult to find volunteering opportunities in the pandemic. And, and the other thing I would just say in response to that is if you can't find a volunteering opportunity that is suitable or close to you or available at, at the moment, there are things that you can do um, within your local community or within your school to persuade people to start doing things for wildlife or you could you know you can talk to your neighbors and persuade them um, to do certain things in their gardens or you can so that there are ways that you can use your initiative to take action even if you can't get a formal um, volunteering role that's probably worth thinking about um, so i'm going to throw open the questions to the panel about qualifications so um Claire, did you specifically want to take the one about um, becoming a ranger and then I'll open it up to any of the panellists who'd like to comment on, on what you feel would be useful qualifications and what to study at university? Um, yeah, so um, I think there's lots of different routes into becoming a ranger. Um, my degree is in zoology, but I know other people have done degrees in things like environmental management or countryside management, things like that. Um, there are courses at uni, but there are also college courses that you can do. Um, so there's no one fixed route to getting in to, um, to being a ranger. And like everyone has said, um, qualifications are good, but just as important as volunteering and getting out there and just building your knowledge as well. I mean, I've just done recruitment actually for, for a post for my, my assistant ranger for the summer. And um, it was really hard because there were loads of fantastic people and some wonderful qualifications between them, but as well as your qualifications, you're really just looking for people to show their passion and to show that they've got out there and they've taken whatever volunteering opportunities they can and they can exhibit their knowledge of Scottish wildlife. Um, and they're just excited about the role as well. And um, that's what we were looking for. Um, I, I would say above and beyond qualifications, although qualifications are fantastic. Um, 
But yeah, there, there are various different routes. So have a look at your local universities and colleges and have a look and see what environmental type courses they offer. No, oh, thanks, Claire. I really agree with that. I think that's a great answer. Did any of the other panellists want to add to what Claire has said? Yeah, I just wanted to add um, exactly what Claire has said, pretty much. But also, if you look at if you're looking at degrees or um, diplomas and things, obviously, key words like conservation, environment, um, wildlife management, that sort of thing. But I would also really look at the format of those courses and if they've got practical element in there. So do they have some of the lectures outdoors? For example, do they have an opportunity to do like a sandwich year, a sandwich placement within that? Um, how much how much connection do they have with other local conservation charities? Do they have sort of networking people that they, they can sort of send you to? Do they have local uh, reserves that they know and they can send you to? So look for the practical element of that as well. Not necessarily to be outdoors so much, but to have the opportunity to do something different to just the lectures. Excellent. No, that's really, really good points, Juliana. Thank you. Um, so that brings us on to uh, the question about top predators. So have you been doing any work or research into, and it's just jumped off my screen, uh, reintroducing top predators such as um, the wolf or the lynx? So uh, as was mentioned earlier by Catherine, the Scottish Wildlife Trust uh, was involved in a big reintroduction project of, of beavers, but we started thinking about top predators like lynx um, a long time ago. And just to explain to those of you uh, who are not familiar with the idea of why top predators are important, it's all about the whole of the food chain and the fact that humans have had such an impact on nature that we've thrown things out of balance. And one of the results of that is that we've got huge amounts of deer, for example, probably more deer than we've ever had in Scotland in the last thousand years. And that not only makes it hard for deer in a cold winter to you know, get enough food, but actually it's terrible for um, the natural regeneration of, of woodlands and, and things like that. So this is one of the reasons why it's important to have that balance. We would love to see lynx return, um, but there's a lot to be done um, in terms of understanding the human conflicts. So for example, what impact they might have on farmers, um, understanding how much habitat is available for them and um, what the disease risks are and things like that. So, so we're involved in early discussions, but our position at the Trust is we'd love to see the return of links. We don't think we're quite ready for that to happen now, but we would like to see that led by local communities rather than um, by an organisation like the Trust specifically. Uh, so yeah, no, that was a great question. Wolves, um, much more uh, controversial. I mean, fantastic question. Uh, but we, we think lynx is definitely the priority because that's more manageable. Um, and and wolf, wolves may be a long time into the future. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of fear around, around wolves. Um, but lynx is, is the priority for the trust. Uh, let's just see what else we've got here. Um, it, unless any of the panel would like to comment on links um, while I just quickly scroll through this. So here's um, an interesting one. If you wanted to work with one type of animal in particular or um, or just animals in particular, would, would you end up working with that animal after a while? Um, so who would like to pick up on that one? Because this is, this is the kind of question, um, it's a very good question because we get asked that kind of question quite a lot. Which of the panel members would like to pick up on that? I can if you like, Joe. Yeah, thanks, Marianne. Um, <laughs> I'm one of the um, Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels kind of project team. Um, I actually always really wanted to work with big cats in Africa. <laughs> And I'm currently working with squirrels. Um, so you'll hear in a little while, I've worked with all sorts of different things, but that was my main thing when I decided I wanted to work with animals. When I was quite little, I wanted to be a vet nurse and all sorts of things. I really, really wanted to go and play with lions and tigers and um, all sorts. And I, there, we don't have them in Scotland. Um, so I also know of many other people that did have that vision in mind and they wanted to work with a particular species and they've just gone and done it. But um, if you do have a favorite species and you really want to work with them, then you can kind of tailor what you try and do volunteering wise to that. And it might not be go and work with that. It might be learn some other skills that might kind of help get you there. 
Um, because as you might have already realized, some of the volunteering positions are quite kind of competitive, let's say. Um, so if you want to go and work with lions in a zoo, there's probably a lot of people that want to do the same thing. Um, so that's what I did. I also realized and had a bit of a change of mind because I thought if I was going to do any research with lions, one, I'd have to go and live in Africa and I wouldn't really see my family very much. But also, I probably wouldn't really get to handle them very much. And I've done a lot of handling of other smaller species. And I decided that actually, I wanted to handle wildlife rather than kind of look at them at a distance and try not to get eaten. So it kind of depends on what you, whether you're definitely really passionate about that or if that changes as you kind of have different experiences as well. So there is the option of doing that, but it might change. You might decide you want to work with something else. So I keep your options open personally. No, it's great, great answer. Thanks. Thanks, Marianne. Um, somebody had also asked, uh, would veterinary skills be uh, useful and in general what, what I would say is that um, you know we're not an animal welfare charity so that's one of the distinctions that it's probably useful for people to understand but there are instances where for example in the Scottish beaver trial where the other lead partner um, was the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland um, that involved veterinary input uh, also in the Scottish wildcat project so not uh, not that much, but but there are uh, certainly examples. Um, Catherine, how are we doing for time? Um, just so that I can judge. How yes, many I think I think we're actually pretty good there. If we want to take it to the little break, and then we'll do some more questions at the end of the second session. I think. Great. Uh, fantastic. So thank you very much for those questions. Thank you, Joe, and to the panelists for, for answering those. There's some really good questions and answers there. What we're going to do is just have a little five minute break. Um, so if everybody comes back here about 17, 18 minutes past uh, four, 20 minutes past four, something like that, uh, we'll get started again. So we've got some more wonderful people to tell you all about their roles and how that how they got into those. So go and have a little break, get yourself a drink and a snack, and we'll meet back here in five.
Okay, hopefully I've got lots of you back. It's now 18 minutes past. Just maybe give it a couple more seconds. If anyone's racing to get back to the sofa. It's nice and easy because you're going to hear from me next. So I'll just get my slides ready. Okay, here we go then. We're going to start off with the second section. We've got another five or six people to tell you all about their roles at the Scottish Wildlife Trust. So we'll crack on. I'm going to kickstart this section and tell you all about what it's like to be a people and wildlife officer, which is my role at the Trust. Um, and often when I tell people that's my job, usually they ask me what exactly that means and what the heck do I do? Because it's not evident from that job title. It's a fairly unusual one. So let's have a look at what people and wildlife officer actually means and what, what a people and wildlife officer actually does. Uh, here's a photo of me, well, a couple of photos of me at work. And I realised when I was putting this presentation together that I don't have many photos of me at work because it's usually me taking the photos of other people. So that's one of my, my jobs to help communicate with people. Essentially, my role is to connect people with wildlife or with, and wildlife with people. Uh, so the clue is in the name when you think about it. But actually, in terms of my day to day tasks and the jobs that I do, really, my role is all about working with people. So if you're somebody who wants to work directly with wildlife and be outside all day every day, then a people and wildlife officer is maybe not the role for you. But that said, I do get to travel all around Scotland and visit my colleagues and the different visitor centres and reserves. So I do actually get to see a lot of Scotland's wonderful wildlife as I'm doing my job, which is another fantastic part of the work that I do. So really my job kind of consists of three main parts. And the first of those is managing certain volunteers and volunteer programs. And that's a huge part of my job as well. It's at least half, if not more than half of the work that I do. And two of those teams are the Wildlife Watch volunteers and the young leaders. Um, the Wildlife Watch volunteers on the left of your screen, this is them at a training day, uh, but normally they'd be out and about working with children. We've got 31 children's groups, the Wildlife Watch groups all around Scotland. And so these volunteers are instrumental in helping us to engage with more children and more families uh, with nature and wildlife and the work of the trust. And the young leaders are a smaller team. There's only 12 young leaders at any one time. Um, and they help us to connect with younger people. Um, as Emma was saying earlier on, Emma is one of our young leaders, help us to connect young people with nature and with the work of the trust, and also make sure that younger people have a voice within our organization and the work that we do. So managing volunteers uh, involves everything from recruiting, uh, to training, to supporting, to promoting, all of that is part of my day to day volunteer management. Um, and it's incredibly rewarding. And it's good fun to get to know volunteers over years sometimes. Um, and you really build those um, relationships. And, and we are all one big team. Um, and, it, and it's incredibly rewarding part of my job. Uh, another key aspect of my role is education and engagement. And they're two fancy ways of saying working with schools, essentially, and working at community events. Um, and uh, I have to apologise for my picture for schools. It's rather difficult to find pictures of schools and children because we get tied up in permissions. So instead, I went with some pictures of some work that some kids did with us. And this was on a shoreline project, uh, which was um, a project that ran in Edinburgh. And we were aiming to get more children connected to the coast because obviously this, uh, Scotland has a, a huge coastline and a lot of people live near the sea, but maybe don't know how to engage with it. So we were getting kids out to the to the coast at Edinburgh, taking part in little activities like rock pooling, uh, sand art, which you can see there. And uh, the key part of the project really was to help to design and create these rock pools made out of cement, which you can see on the left there. If you make the habitat less uh, smooth, uh, if you put more crevices in there, you create more opportunities for these pools to form and more wildlife has a habitat, has a home. So that's what we were doing with that particular school. And we do a lot of school visits. We go to schools uh, across Scotland and teach them about Scottish wildlife and get them outside. And the schools also come and visit us at our visitor centres um, and at our sites and reserves as well. So our education work is key and we get to support that all around Scotland, which is really nice. 
and the community events is a similar sort of thing, but it's a different kind of interaction. So it's usually you'll see hundreds of people a day. Uh, it's very fast paced and you want quick engaging activities and little snippets of information that you want to be able to get across quickly to people. And it's all about having fun and learning in a really fun way. So those days are really, really fun and interesting. We meet loads of really um, interesting, nice, friendly people um, and they can be hugely demanding on your energy, but they're absolutely brilliant to do and you always feel super happy after those. And the third part of my role is all about communication, really, um, making sure that uh, we're communicating our information out to people so that everybody knows about what we're doing and also knows about um, the wildlife that we have in Scotland. You know, we've got this knowledge, we want to share it with people. Um, and that's part of what I do. So especially this year, we've been creative resources, for example, making videos, which is what this is a, an image of. It's a still from a dolphin video, which I made. And I, uh, we put those to the digital comms team and they put those out on things like social media and on our website uh, so that everybody can see them and engage with them. Another thing that I do is create the content for our children's magazine, Wildlife Watch magazine, along with the comms team. And that goes out four times a year. That's a really fun part of my job. I basically get to research all sorts of fun things about wildlife and, and, and write them down and find lots of fun pictures to go with them. So that's a great part of my job really really interesting thing to be able to do some of the things that I might do on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of communication is I need to answer people's inquiries I might need to write a blog for our comms team um, and uh, again making resources educational material things that we can put on the learning zone things that we can use in a workshop I need to be able to speak to people whether that's in a presentation like this or whether that's uh, talking to people one-on-one -on -one or talking to volunteers so communication skills are absolutely key to this kind of role. So I thought I'd put down the skills that I thought were essential to meet those three parts of my role. And I managed to make them into the shape of a hedgehog. And once I'd made them into the shape of a hedgehog, I thought, well, I'm going to stick with that because why not? Hedgehogs are awesome. So here you can see some words in a word cloud. That's what this is. And if you want to Google word clouds, you can get lost in having fun for hours making word clouds. So do make sure you've got some time before you start doing that. But this just gives you an idea of the key skills that I think you might need to do the job of a people and wildlife officer. And you'll see in there that the two sort of biggest ones are communication and management, uh, but also transferable skills like organization, flexibility um, uh, and uh, there was another one in there, knowledge. Um, I do actually have to have quite a broad knowledge base um, because I could be talking about anything from day to day or I could be writing about anything from day to day. So I need to have a good background knowledge of wildlife and I also need to have the skills to be able to research a little bit more about wildlife and conservation issues and the trust's work so that I can then communicate that out to people. So how did I get here? Well, that's a good question. And it's it's a fairly boring answer, actually, compared to some of my colleagues' answers. I have to say I followed a fairly straight route um, to, the, to where I am today. I came out of school and went straight to university. I was very academic. I liked school a lot. And within those subjects at school, I liked science. And within science, I liked biology. So off I went to university to study biological sciences. Um, and that gave me a really good background knowledge good understanding of biological and ecological principles, which has stood me in good stead. And then I came out of that and realized I couldn't get a job anywhere because I didn't have any practical knowledge. I hadn't done any volunteering um, and I didn't really understand what conservation was. And uh, so I had started to do some research into the things that I enjoyed. I knew that I liked animals. I knew that I liked um, conservation, science, sort of, uh, plants, all that kind of biology, more than cells, genes, that sort of stuff. I'd worked that out at university. So I had a look for courses. I saw this course and I went off back to university again. This course was amazing. This is a key step in my career journey because it was more applied. It's a one year course and MSc is a master's and they're usually a one year course or they're at the end, they're the fourth year of your four year degree. Usually it's one of those two things. And this was a one year course. And I learned so much in that one year, I probably learned more uh, than I did in the, in the first degree. 
and we learned all sorts of things. Uh, we had people come and speak to us from conservation organizations. We used to practice our wildlife ID. We'd go out and do surveying techniques. Uh, I saw how bird ringing was done. You know, I did all these things that I didn't even know existed until I went and did this course. And then I came out of that and I thought, aha, I understand the conservation sector. Now I know what I need to do. So I left there and I started to do those things, started volunteering, doing practical volunteering, and I needed some money. So I saved up, I got a normal job. Um, you need to build up your volunteer experience and volunteering isn't cheap because obviously no one's paying you while you're doing it. So I needed to save up and I got a normal job in admin to do that. And then I started to apply for residential volunteering or internships so that I could get a nice long uh, experience essentially under my belt and I noticed that that was something that people seemed to have what, who were getting these jobs so I went and applied to well and dolphin conservation at Spay Bay who you've already heard about in Emma's presentation so I went a couple of years before Emma um, and I applied to be an education um, assistant or, or residential education volunteer I think they call it for eight months at Well and Dolphin Conservation, and I was incredibly lucky to get that role. And that role changed my life in a number of ways, but particularly for the career. It was absolutely incredible. And it, I learned so much uh, uh, over those eight months, and it gave me all the experiences I then needed to apply for jobs. It also confirmed for me that education was what I wanted to do. I already had an idea about it. But along this journey and certainly doing that internship, I realized that, yes, I like science, but where my strength really is, is in communicating and communicating that science and that wildlife knowledge to other people. Um, and so doing that experience really helped me to, to realize that and to keep going along that path. And then I came out of that and I got my first paid job at RSPB Dolphin Watch, which again crosses paths with Emma's story, which you heard earlier on. It was actually the year that I was uh, working at RSPB Dolphin Watch that um, I met Emma. Emma was one of my volunteers. So this is kind of goes back into what we were saying about networking, meeting people in the conservation sector. And um, you'll bump into them later on. Um, and that was a wonderful experience. Again, my job there was as people engagement officer. So again, that kind of working with people, educating people, but being outside and seeing wildlife at the same time. So that was a really wonderful job to have. And then I went from that job into this job. So you can see that um, once I had got those two key things, the MSc, which gave me lots of applied knowledge and the residential volunteering opportunity, it, I was basically getting interviews for every job I applied for. And so they were the things that made the difference. Um, and, uh, and essentially that's volunteering because that residential volunteering opportunity was a huge span of volunteering. And it fits into what you've heard from everybody else. If you build up your skills and your knowledge with volunteering, not only will you find out what you want to do and what you're good at, you'll build up um, the interesting parts of your application, essentially. So when people are recruiting, that will stand you out compared to everybody else. So my top tips for you then are to study what you enjoy and what you're good at. And just to qualify the what you're good at bit, because what you're good at will change and obviously you don't know if you're good at something if you've not tried it yet so it's important to keep an open mind and to keep trying things as you go through and doing different volunteering different types of work um but when you get to the point where you have to make a decision where you have to pick a course or you have to pick some subjects to study it is important to just um assess your own skills and your own abilities so i realized i'm good at communicating I'm going to carry on applying for the communicating roles, things like education, um, volunteer management. Those were the roles I decided, right, I'm good at this. That's what I'm going to apply for. And I enjoy it. Um, I'll give you another example. When I was at school, I was good at most things and I could do maths, but I wouldn't say I was good at it. You know, I got good grades, but it used to take me ages. So when I got to A levels, I made the decision. I was like, right, I don't need maths to go and do biology at university. And there's other things I'm good at and I enjoy. So I picked those other things. So sometimes you have to make those decisions, at which point it's good to work out what are your skills? What are the things that make you use that you're good at and pair them with the things you enjoy? And that way you will naturally make decisions that take you on the path that's going to be good for you. 
volunteer, volunteer, volunteer. It's just so much fun. You meet people and you'll learn things. It's just such a good idea. Read, research and participate. So what I mean by that is if you're out and about and you see some wildlife that you like, don't leave it there. Don't just think, oh, that was nice. Go home and look it up. See if you can find some more stuff about it. Maybe join something as a result. Maybe there are other people that like whatever you've seen and you can you can share knowledge with them. Follow it up, find out more information and you'll naturally start to become a little expert in that, in, in that area. Uh, join clubs, societies and social media groups. Uh, you'll meet like-minded people. And that will mean that you'll have access to more opportunities because people share opportunities. So you'll be in the right place. You'll see the opportunities quicker um, and that will help you on your route through your career. Uh, as well as being fun and you'll make friends, which is always a nice bonus. Uh, and then my last top tip, develop your transferable skills. And by transferable skills, I mean things that you can do in any job. So communicating, organizing things, um, uh, being flexible, all of those sorts of things uh, we are looking for when, or people are looking for when they're recruiting people for their team, teamwork and leadership skills. These are all things that you can develop at school or in your after school clubs, whatever you're doing, doesn't necessarily need to be in conservation, but they'll all be things that will help you when you go for these kinds of jobs. So that's the end of my little presentation on what it's like to be a people and wildlife officer. If you've got any questions on that, I'll be happy to try and answer for you at the end of today's session. Just pop them in the questions tab. Thank you very much for listening. I am going to stop that there because the next person we have speaking is Michelle. And I'll just find Michelle's presentation for you. There we are, Michelle, over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Catherine. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Michelle, and I work as a reserves project officer in the north of Scotland, um, where I look after 14 of the Trust Wildlife Reserves located across the Highlands and Islands. Alongside my manager, Mark, we have two rangers and a team of volunteers. Our wildlife reserves provide a safe haven for all wildlife, um, from plants, insects, fungi, birds and mammals. And my job is to ensure that the variety of habitats that they support are managed to support the wealth of wildlife and so that visitors can come and enjoy these wonderful places and stay safe. My job is mostly outdoors, at least four days a week um, or more, come rain, shine, snow, midges, ticks and mud. So if you don't like the mud or rain and if you don't like getting your hands dirty, then this sort of job is probably not for you. I love it. I'm very, very lucky to be able to see spectacular places, wonderful wildlife, and I work with some very passionate and interesting people. So everyone's journey is very different, as you've seen today. There is a common theme with, with volunteering. Um, mine has been quite varied. These photos here are in no particular order of places I've worked. Um, but I, I worked hard at school. I went to university to get a degree, I initially went to do nursing. But I decided I wanted to, to save the planet. So I, I changed my degree after a year in and did geography. When I left university, I got a desk based job for a while. And then I realized that sitting behind a desk really wasn't for me. So I volunteered for a wildlife trust in England where I built outdoor field skills and practical skills in conservation. And after eight months of volunteering, I was delighted to get my first paid job in conservation. I then went traveling back to university and did a master's degree in ecology, um, worked again for another wildlife trust. Um, I went to Canada and worked as a park ranger where I got to live alongside those top predators we were talking about earlier, such as lynx, wolves, and bears. Then I moved uh, to Scotland and I worked with Nature Scott and now with Scottish Wildlife Trust. But that's with a variety of other jobs in between, from, from other conservation type jobs, to farm work, shop work, working on a ski hill, waitressing, um, and lots of volunteering. And I still volunteer now for, for wildlife causes outside of my day job. So what's in an average day as a reserves project officer? Well, I check the weather a lot and uh, plan my days and weeks ahead, but that is always open to change depending on the, the weather report. 
So I arrive at my office, this is my workshop, where I keep all the tools and equipment that I need for work on our reserves, and I load up the vehicle with what I need for the day ahead. So as you can see from this slide, we get to use a variety of rather nice toys, uh, sorry, tools, um, which we get trained on, on how to use safely. Um, I actually got my brush cutter and chainsaw certificate when I was a volunteer and um, the Wildlife Trust I was with paid for that training and all other training I've undertaken as part of my job or in my own time. And, and just want to explain here again, as everybody said, how key it was the volunteer experience that I got for me in getting my first job in conservation. And it is an expectation of most conservation jobs that you have some volunteer experience in your area of interest. And I appreciate that doing a full placement like I did for eight months is not affordable or feasible for everyone. Like Catherine, I spent a year working in a desk-based job in London to save up to be able to volunteer. But you don't have to do a placement like that. You could dedicate one day a week, one day a month, or whatever you can manage. And you also don't need to go to far flung places like, like Canada. There will be lots of opportunities near your doorstep. We have the next slide. Thanks. So every day is different. And that's what I really love about my job. Um, so I could be one day using hand tools to build or repair a style or a bridge. Um, to make it safe for people or repair a fence to make it safe for animals, make and install signs, um, removing invasive species which threaten biodiversity, tree planting, wildlife surveys, and much, much more. There is a lot of problem solving in this role because um, when you work outside, things don't always go to plan. Things break, the ground is a lot harder than you ever imagined, the river floods, it snows, it rains, you forgot to pack your lunch. That's okay, you just need to have a very open mind, be flexible, adaptable, you solve the problems and you learn from it. And this, this slide here is showing um, one of the best things about my job is the people, um, the volunteers who give up their own time to help out the wildlife. I love working with volunteers and I'm always in awe of their dedication and spirit. And I really value all the things that I learn from my volunteers. But the very best thing about my job is seeing um, amazing wildlife and places and knowing that each day I'm doing something to help look after the wildlife for, for now, for us, for you and for all the generations that follow. So Aldo Leopold is an American author and naturalist and he coined the phrase thinking like a mountain. And I encourage you when thinking about your career paths whether it's conservation or something else, to think like a mountain, think big, face new grounds and challenges head on and work hard to achieve your goals. When I did my degree, I got a lower grade than I hoped for and I was really disappointed and quite upset at the time. But I look back now and realize that that didn't actually stop me from realizing my goals. I, got, I volunteered, I got a great job with the Wildlife Trust, went back to university to do a master's degree and, and got grades I was happier with. So it's important to work hard, but also to not let your grades define you or to stop you from achieving your goals. And it is a big, exciting world. And if you work hard, you'll be amazed at what you can achieve. Some of my volunteers will say to me, oh, I'm not gonna apply for that job. I don't think I've got enough experience. I always say to them, well, if you meet most of the criteria, you should apply and let the employer decide whether they think you're suitable. Because when I went to Canada, I honestly never dreamed I would get a job as a park ranger in the Yukon. I remember filling in the application form and thinking, no way will I get this job. But with the experience I had, um, and I did some research, after two interviews, I got the job and spent six years there. It was amazing. So my message to you is dream big and think like a mountain. And if you ever just need a little bit of inspiration on your path, do take time, even just now and again, to stop and enjoy nature. You will always find it inspiring. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions later on. Thanks so much, Michelle. That was brilliant. I love that. Think like a mountain. And it's so true. Your grades don't define you. 
there's a whole big wide world out there and don't count yourself out if you're looking at job applications they can be a bit scary in terms of how much criteria they want but as michelle says if you think you match most of it go for it and let the recruiters make the decision don't count yourself out it's a really good tip um we had a poll during your presentation michelle which was would you like to work outside and 83 percent of people said yes which is amazing. So I think a lot of people will be uh, looking quite uh, favourably on all those wonderful pictures and things that you get to get up to outdoors. Um, a couple of people, 5% says no, so that's fine as well. Uh, and 13% don't know. So maybe just uh, need to get out there, out there and try and see if it's the kind of thing for you. Okay, fantastic. Let's move on to the next person. Um, I just need to bring up the presentation because the next person we have is Mary Ann. So let's find Marianne. There we go. Over to you, Marianne. Thanks, Catherine. Hi again, everyone. Um, I'm Marianne, and I am the Red Squirrel Conservation Officer for Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels. Uh, firstly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the project, and then I'll go on to, to how I actually got here, um, which I touched on a little bit earlier. Oh, back another one. Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you heard about our project a little bit, both from Catherine and from Juliana. So I'm one of five different Red Squirrel Conservation Officers across Scotland. We look after the darker regions on this map. I look after Argyll and Trossachs. Uh, we're a partnership project, as mentioned before. So all the logos at the bottom um, show who provide our funding or who the partners are as well. And there has to be someone to lead it. And they collect everyone's thoughts together and then make a plan of what we're going to do. And for this, that project leader is the Scottish Wildlife Trust, which is why I'm here today. Uh, so a little bit about red squirrel history. So the map on the left shows red squirrels in 1952 in the UK. They used to be everywhere. All the little flags with the squirrel heads on are where there's red squirrels and they didn't have to share anything with grey squirrels, which is the other squirrel that you can find in the UK. If you look more recently to 2012, um, you can see there's only one little flag and that's up in Scotland with us and the rest of the country's got very few little red patches and all those red patches elsewhere have to share their resources with grey squirrels. We're really lucky. Um, there's about 140,000 reds, which isn't very much in the UK compared to 3 million greys. But in Scotland, as Catherine mentioned earlier, we've got three quarters of that population. So we're really, really lucky here. So grey squirrels shouldn't really be here. Um, they were brought over by the Victorians from America. They were the adventurers that went out. They didn't have cameras to take photos and show people what they found when they came home. So they actually brought the grey squirrel back with them as gifts. Um, unfortunately, they're a bit too good at being squirrels. They're about twice the size and they're really good at taking over and pushing the red squirrels out of those areas. So they compete for food and resources. They can unfortunately also carry a disease that doesn't affect them, but it's really lethal to red squirrels. So a lot of what I do is trying to keep red and grey squirrels away from each other. Um, to do that, the first thing we have to do is find out where they are. So we run some surveys with the feeder boxes on that bottom picture, but we also ask people to let us know. And you've heard both um, Catherine and Juliana say that you can report your sighting. Um, you can report any red or grey squirrel sighting anywhere in Scotland. Um, once we then know where red and grey squirrels are, we can then try and separate them. And we also test some of the grey squirrels to see if they've got any signs of having the disease so we know if it's getting nearer to the red squirrel populations. We do lots of different things in our area. Um, we spend a lot of different time talking to people, letting them know about the project. And I write articles. I also organise all the activities. So I recruit and train all the volunteers um, and basically do everything to do with squirrels in my little patch. So I haven't always worked with squirrels as you kind of got a little bit of a sneak preview before and as you can see a lot of these pictures are a little bit different to working with squirrels so I'm now going to kind of how I got to this position in the first place. So I'm originally from West London and I grew up with lots of animals, lots of pets and surrounded by farms. I've always loved animals. Um, I worked as a waitress during school so that I could take a gap year between school and university. I got offered a place, but then I decided that I wanted to wait a year. So they said, OK, we'll hold that open for you. And I went to work with um, animals at a wildlife rehab centre in South Africa called Mahola Hola. Um, I got to look after all sorts of things, big and small. Um, I actually had to pay a little bit of money for like food and accommodation for that. Um, and I realised I still really wanted to work with animals, but I didn't quite know how. Um, so I then came back to the UK and I 
I went to Kiel University. I did an undergraduate degree in biology and psychology. And that's partly because I didn't actually know what I wanted to do and I enjoyed both of them at school. In fact, I actually thought I was going to become a music therapist and that's definitely not where I ended up. Um, when I was at uni, I heard about an organization called Operation Wallacea and um, you can pay a bit of money to go for like food and accommodation and go and help them as a volunteer. So I went to Honduras in the summers, um, both um, summers during uni when I didn't have any classes. The first I just helped with all sorts of things. And then in the second year, I actually did my biology project on hummingbirds, which was pretty cool. I learned all sorts of different skills. Um, I'm really good at taking breaks. So after that, I then took another break, did some odd jobs um, before deciding I wanted to carry on and really go into conservation and biodiversity and did a master's in Cornwall. And I studied barn swallows. Again, learning lots of different things. I learned how to handle the chicks. I got experience working with landowners to go and look at the barn swallows in their sheds on their farmland. And I also got to teach other students how to do things too. So after my master's, again, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, so I actually bounced around the world quite a lot, again, volunteering. So you can get research assistant or volunteer positions where you can spend about three to six months doing helping people out with their research um, as a volunteer. So you don't tend to have to pay to do any of this, but um, sometimes you get food, accommodation and flights, depending on obviously where you're helping out. So you don't get paid, but you also don't have to pay for anything either. So it's quite nice. Um, I got to visit South Africa, Tasmania and Canada. And I got to work with all sorts of different birds and small mammals as well. I learned quite a lot and I um, sometimes even went back to the same place and actually led the team of volunteers. After that, I actually got the opportunity to um, do a PhD. I tried and tried is definitely the key word here because I tried to do two different PhDs and didn't quite finish either. Um, and also in between them, I suddenly ended up working as a motel manager in New Zealand, which was a little bit odd, not quite what I had planned. Um, but actually that was really cool too, because I got to talk to everyone that was coming through the motel. And I also waitress for a bit. So all the customers in the cafe about the amazing views that we were surrounded by, but also all the wildlife and things. And actually kind of got to communicate with members of the public about wildlife, not in Scotland, but in New Zealand, but that was really helpful. Um, in both projects, I worked with mammals and that's all right, don't worry, Catherine. Um, <laughs> and I got to lead all of the organize, um, all the work. I got to organize everything, sort out all the logistics of moving things and people and animals, sometimes different places and got to lead loads of groups of volunteers. Finally, I then came back to the UK in 2015 I um, was living with my parents and then my husband, as he had now become, um, also stayed with me at my parents' house. So we needed to get some money so we could get our own place. Uh, so I ended up working in Aldi grocery store. Uh, I then ended up doing a bit of volunteering at local parks, just helping them clear up and looking after rubbish and things, um, but kept applying for conservation jobs. Um, I actually applied for the project and the diff there's five different conservation officer positions. I applied for every single one of them and then finally got this one um, in December 2016. And I have been here ever since. And that is me. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Marianne. That was absolutely wonderful presentation. I feel like I've gone a little journey with you around the world as well, which is fantastic. Um, perfect example there that you can work out what you want to do as you go along take or take opportunities when they come up and you know you'll get there you'll get into the what's right for you by doing that um the poll that came up during Marianne's talk was would you like to work in the UK overseas or both and we've got an adventurous bunch in our audience today they want to do both 72 percent of you would like to go and try working in both overseas and in the UK which is brilliant and then 14 percent just in the UK and 14 percent overseas so we've got a good mix there in the audience and that's wonderful because as we said earlier on there's, cons there's conservation work to be done everywhere um okay next up we have Ali so I'll just bring up your slides Ali There we go, when you're ready. Perfect, thank you. Uh, okay, so hi everyone. Um, so I'm uh, Ali Lemon and I'm a volunteer with the Trust. So I am going to, quick, uh, just a quick overview. So I'm going to tell you quickly about my current job. Um, then I'll tell you about the roles I have with the Scottish Wildlife Trust. 
and then I will briefly take you through a whistle stop tour of how I got to where I am today. So my current job is I am the conservation officer for RSPB Scotland. I'm one of a team of conservation officers and we all cover different parts of the, the country. Um, what we do most of the time is casework. So casework is things like wind farm applications, forestry applications, or housing developments. So they'll come in to us from uh, planners and then we'll give them advice on what important wildlife's in the area, how they might be able to adapt their plans to um, help that wildlife and that sort of thing. Um, I also undertake surveys for priority species. So these are species that are really important to the RSPB. Um, so things like black grouse and different types of insects and things as well. And then I also do public talks like this one, but also to local groups and interest groups. So um, natural history societies and things throughout the country, I'll go and give talks as well to them. And then I also get involved with other projects that might be funded by like the Heritage Lottery Fund and things like that. And I'll help out with those as well. So my roles with the Scottish Wildlife Trust. So the first role that I had with the trust was I was a member of the committee for a local group. So the, the Scottish Wildlife Trust have a network of local groups. So these are uh, members of the trust to come together and they organize events at a community level and um, like winter talks. And um, for the committee, I am currently the secretary. So that means that I send out meeting requests. I tell people about events. I get in touch about campaigns and that sort of thing. Um, and then I'm also a young leader. So you heard about the young leaders um, from Emma and from Catherine. So I'll, I'm also one of those young leaders and I help out with that as well. But I'll move on because um, you've heard about it already. And so I'm also a trustee um, for the Scottish Wildlife Trust. And I was fortunate enough to get elected to this position by the members of the charity. So this basically means that I work with the senior management, um, so people like Joe, and uh, we look at the direction of the charity, where it's going, we look at the finances, um, make sure that the charity is in a stable position, and also uh, give ideas and use the knowledge that we have to help uh, guide the trust and give the trust ideas as well. So how did I get to where I am today? So I was very fortunate when I was younger that I spent almost all of my summers on the west coast of Scotland, digging around in rock pools, getting very muddy, looking um, in woodlands. And also my mum used to point out the birds at bird, on the bird feeders and things. And I was really fortunate to have this experience. And that's where my love for nature really came from. So this led me on to go um, to Stirling University and study um, marine biology. And while I was at uni, I got involved with societies and clubs um, gaining loads of different types of skills like events management, uh, writing articles for student magazines and that sort of thing. I then decided that I wanted to get more involved with events. So I went on and volunteered at the Olympic Games. I got a job at the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup as well. And then I used these skills and then I went on to study a master's as well, um, which like Catherine, um, had, that was really where I got my sort of practical skills from so my bird id and that sort of thing and um, the masters really helped with that it was a lot more applied than my undergraduate um, and then after my masters i actually was fortunate enough to get a job with frog life um, and then um, this was a traineeship so this was about shadowing the members of staff at frog life learning about what they had done how they'd got into the job and then also um, going out and working on projects like the um, gardening for wildlife workshops, uh, doing school sessions, digging ponds, and really learning the basics about like sort of what a conservation job might be like. Alongside this, I also continued to do some volunteering. So I volunteered with Scottish Badgers, doing surveys and helping out with events. And then I managed to get a, another job after this. Um, so uh, with Bug Life. Um, and this was where I worked on um, freshwater invertebrates and pollinators, so bees and butterflies, doing education lessons again, but also doing practical stuff like surveys and um, doing translocation things, so moving one species um, to a different area and things like that. Um, but alongside all of this, I was always volunteering and I always had the two on the go at the same time. Um, and it was just to keep up those skills to diversify what I was doing and always making sure that I was networking. Um, so it was actually at my job with Frog Life that I first met Catherine um, about four years ago um, and we've kind of bumped into each other ever since. So the, the community, especially in Scotland, is quite small. So it's, it's important to get out and volunteer and like get to know other people. And that this is me at the a parliament event with the young leaders. And then I eventually got my first full time permanent job with the RSPB two years ago as a community engagement officer. And then I moved to my current role just over a year ago as conservation officer. 
Um, and then that's me. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Ali. I'm sorry there, the slides ran away with me. They no, were no, running no, automatic. No, <laughs> no, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Move on. But that was wonderful. And and um, as Ali says, getting involved in lots of different things and keeping the volunteering going, even when you've got that first paid job, is really beneficial. And yeah, there was a period of time where I would keep bumping into Ali and every time I met him, he, he had a new hat on, he had a new role or a new volunteer role. And it was brilliant. And there's a few volunteers I have like that as well. It's a small world and you make the, these connections and that. That's a good thing. Um, fantastic. Thank you so much, Ali. The next person we have is Sarah. Uh, so, Sarah, if you want to share your screen. That's great. Good afternoon. Can everyone see my screen? Can you see my screen there, Catherine? Yeah, great stuff. Brilliant. Happy Friday, everyone. Um, so my name is Sarah Proctor. Um, I'm the Head of Development and Communications at the IUCN, so the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, UK Peatland Programme. And we're a programme that's very kindly hosted by Scottish Wildlife Trust. Um, so we're part of the team based in Edinburgh. And peatlands, oh, peatlands when I can manage to, there we go. So peatlands are found in almost every country across the world, from the Arctic tundra to the tropics, the rainforests um, of the tropics, from mountains to where the land meets the sea, the fresh water. And of course, here in Scotland. So, the UK uh, is one of the world's top 10 countries in terms of its peatland area. And 60% of the peatlands in the UK are here in Scotland. So a really important habitat in Scotland. Um, and it puts Scotland uh, as an important country in terms of peatlands globally. But what's so special about peatlands? Why, why do we care? Is it their insect eating plants and wonderful wildlife? Is it their wide open spaces? Is it that they're great to explore mini rainforests on our doorstep? Is it that they're places that we live, work and play? Is it the drinking water they provide? And they provide about 70% of our drinking water here in the UK come from areas that are dominated by peatland. Is it that they can help to protect us from flooding? So peatlands can slow the flow of water during storm events, uh, especially compared to um, peatlands that are not in not such good condition. Is it that they can tell us about our past? So peatlands preserve our cultural and our environmental history. Is it that they can help to protect our future? So peatlands are the largest land-based carbon store in the world. And so healthy peatlands are really important for uh, managing climate change. And my job, um, or part of my job, is sharing all these special things about peatlands, because um, peatlands are special in all these different ways, and to different people. So different people, different groups of people are kind of focused on the different benefits of, of peatlands. And so on our website, you can see um, some of the projects that focus on peatlands and deliver peatland restoration. So making peatlands in better condition um, around the UK. We collate the uh, UK peatland strategy. So inform politicians around the, the four countries that make up the UK uh, about how you can conserve and restore peatlands. We share newsletters, so stories about what's happening around our peatlands and, and the people that work on peatlands around the UK through our newsletter. We pull together evidence and information for policy briefings, so people that are making decisions in government um, and around policies. We pull together science and research and put that in the context of practical uh, restoration for peatlands, so practical management, and policy. We raise awareness, we shout about how important peatlands are um, and there's opportunities for, for yourselves to get involved in Bog Day, which happens the fourth Sunday of July every year. 
And we also on our website share learning and training resources to find out about how peatlands function and how to conserve and to, to manage peatlands sustainably. And so that's a big part of the, the role I'm in now. Um, I haven't always worked in this role. So my previous role was in the Peak District in England, still on peatlands. Um, and about 10, 15 years ago, the peatlands there didn't look so healthy. Um, they looked a lot like, in fact, they looked exactly like the, the picture um, here. So very degraded, no wildlife um, and all of those benefits we talked about uh, become risks, they become disbenefits. The water coming off these peatlands, not so good for drinking. Um, and I worked within the team. So this picture is the same, same landscape as you've just seen. But after a few years of restoration work, so working with teams of people, reintroducing plants, stabilizing the soil, and putting those peatlands on a road to uh, recovery, on a road to become healthy, functioning peatlands again. And my job there was very much about research and monitoring the science of peatlands, how we, we can help the guys on the ground um, deliver that work uh, better and so we can understand how they're recovering. Um, part of my role was teaching other people how to do that, that research and monitoring too, um, which was fantastic. And that time there really taught me a lot about peatlands in the UK. And so this is the Peak District. That's a, a map of the UK at night. And you can see the Peak District in that red square there surrounded by lights, city lights. And not all peatlands are remote. So quite often in Scotland, we think of our peatlands being the, the highlands and quite remote areas, but that's not always the case. Um, and so working with people and communities that live in peatlands and around peatlands and visit them is a really important part of making sure that those landscapes are, are looked after and conserved. However, I'm also really lucky that I've worked in some more remote places and not always on peatlands. So before I joined Mills of the Future, I worked out in Madagascar, so in high elevation forests. And I was working out there looking at uh, lemurs and, and doing a census of lemur species and looking at an area of high altitude forest that hadn't been uh, really explored in terms of, of the lemur species that lived there and what effect people had on them. Um, and so it was one of the most amazing and challenging things I've, I've ever done. I learned a lot quite quickly um, from being in that landscape. And I wouldn't have been able to do it at all um, if it wasn't working with a local team of amazing guides. Their local knowledge, their local enthusiasm made the project possible and I would say teamwork is important. These guys saved my life literally uh, more than once. Um, another important part of the project, equally so to finding the lemurs and charting what was there um, to look after them in future was working with local communities and working with the local communities that will look after these landscapes and this, these wildlife in the future. Hugely, uh, hugely important to engage with local communities. And as you've heard today, probably from, from more or less everyone, um, I started off when I was at school, as soon as I was old enough, I started off volunteering. So looking for opportunities to work with animals and to work with wildlife. So I worked in zoos that have long since shut down, in birds of prey centers, so really rehabilitation centers. I volunteered in offices, so I volunteered at uh, Born Free Foundations, stuffy envelopes, um, and for a wildlife hospital as well. And all of those were very much focused on, on animals and on wildlife itself. Um, and then I went off to university and I did my, um, did my honors degree, so did my undergraduate in zoology at Edinburgh. And I learned a lot more about habitats and how important it is to look after the habitats that these animals are, are within and all of the ways that they, they interact um, or some of the ways that they interact with each other. I also volunteered uh, with Scottish Wildlife Trust when I was at university and helped set up the Wildlife Watch Group um, at Holyrood in Edinburgh, which was fantastic. Um, 
I was then lucky enough to go off and work in the orangutan health project out in Sumatra in Indonesia. And again, that was all about helping to understand how species, in this case, the orangutan, depends on its habitat and the health of that habitat for survival. Um, I then came back and decided to do a master's at the University of York in ecology and environmental management. Um, and then went out to Madagascar. So, so you know the story from there. I think the other thing to mention is while I was doing all of these things, like probably everybody else you've heard from today, I worked in jobs that had nothing to do with wildlife or nature conservation, but paved the bills and gave me experience and skills that helped me with my career today, which, which is in nature conservation. So I think my three things that I would want to tell my younger self and make the most of opportunities, and if those opportunities are not, not quite there, hunt them out, find them, make those opportunities. Um, I would say explore. So explore different things and different opportunities from working in offices to, to getting out and, and exploring habitats and volunteering in different places to find the things that, that you enjoy doing. Um, and I would also say that it's fantastic to be able to actually have a role working in nature conservation, but there are so many people in different sectors that help nature in terms of finance and planning and education. So it's, it's not just being lucky enough to work directly with nature conservation, but to bring those messages to, to whatever you end up doing. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you so, so much, Sarah, for that presentation. That was wonderful. And to see those amazing habitats, those peatland habitats um, right across the UK and all the different work that you can do on those. It's definitely going to take part in uh, Bog Day in July. That's the one for the calendars, everybody, International Bog Day. Um, and again, another example of how you can take part in lots of different things and you can be in lots of different countries working around the world. Um, you don't have to just, you know, you won't always be just picking one job and staying in it for the rest of your life. So it's a great example of that. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I know we've ever run um, a little bit, so please do stick with us if you can. Hopefully you're finding it interesting. We've just got one more presentation for you uh, from our, our lovely member of staff, and then we'll have a little bit of a and a um, But as I say, it is being recorded. So if you do need to dash off, uh, you can catch up on this last little bit when we put the recording out. Um, okay, fantastic. I think I'll hand over then to Claire to finish finish us off with the last presentation of the day. Hello. Can you see and hear me? Yes, all good. Fantastic. Hi, um, thanks for hanging on. Uh, my name's Claire Toner. I'm the Clyde Valley Ranger for the Scottish Wildlife Trust. Um, so I help to look after five nature reserves in the Clyde Valley in South Lanarkshire. Um, so we improve and maintain them for wildlife that's living there but also for people to come and visit um, and the picture you see there is Coralin waterfall which is the biggest waterfall at Falls of Clyde which is where I spend a lot of my time um, so one of the best things about my job is the variety um, so this is a little overview of some of the things I get up to um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So if I start from the left, you can see pictures of our lovely volunteers who are working really hard doing different practical tasks. And they're a great bunch of people. They have a wealth of expertise. So I am learning from them as well. And um, they give up their time. And we're really lucky to have such a dedicated bunch of people that help us to achieve our goals. Um, on the wildlife reserves, but also in the wider um, Scottish Wildlife Trust. The next two pictures, um, the butterfly, and you can see a little nest of nestlings there. And um, they represent some of the biodiversity monitoring that goes on on the wildlife reserves. So we go out on a regular basis and collect data so we can look at different trends and see how species might change over time. Um, and our data also feeds into um, a national data set. So we can look at changes in a wider context, for example, and we can look at effects of climate change on certain species. 
And um, the bottom picture with the tree is to illustrate that we have to be ready to sometimes um, deal with things as they appear. So we had planned to go out and put some fencing up on this day, but when we got to the reserve, we were met with two trees that have been blown down in a storm. So we had to chop them up and take them off because they'd fallen over the road. Um, the pictures on the right show two of our events. So the top one is a dipper watch. And um, there we are set up at the river to speak to visitors about different wildlife that they can see at the river, particularly um, the, the dipper, which is a small brown bird, which actually flies underwater to catch its prey. So it eats little invertebrates. And then the bottom picture is when I was transformed into a witch for Halloween at our Halloween event. So I helped the participants to make um, brooms and then we cast magic spells to see if we could fly them. Um, so these are some of my favorite things about being a countryside ranger. Um, the variety of practical tasks. I really find it rewarding to um, see something from start to finish. So we might identify a problem, say on one of our reserve inspections, we might notice that something's broken. So we see that as a, there's a problem, we need to come up with a solution. So we might have different ideas of how to fix it. And then we need to implement that solution. And then, um, then as you can see there, we've built this bridge to replace um, one that was um, a, a bit broken. The next picture along, you can see some very enthusiastic people. These are my team members, so they work with me at Falls of Clyde, and they represent some of the people that I come across um, within my team, but also they're amazing people who work for Scottish Wildlife Trust as well. And I have a great team of volunteers, as you saw pictures of them before. Also, we have thousands of visitors that come and visit our nature reserves, and I really enjoy meeting them and talking to them, hearing about their stories, and also finding different things you know that I didn't know about wildlife maybe from uh, where they live and um, so I've got a couple of videos to show you just now as well so this one here you can see badgers running across and um, so this represents the wildlife that I have the privilege of seeing on a daily basis I don't say that I see badgers on a daily basis but um, these are badgers um, that we um, view on our badger watches um, and we set up trail cameras to monitor them as well. So if you look at the video, you may be, be able to count them. So there's two adults, two sub-adults and three babies. Um, but what we noticed from subsequent footage was there was actually five babies. And this is kind of the maximum amount um, of badger cub that, that we born. So that then shows us that our conservation efforts are working. So the habitat is really good. They have space to live and they have plenty of food. So they're able to have a big um, litter. Uh, and then the next video, please. So um, this is in contrast to the picture I showed you before. So it's the same waterfall, it's Coraline. And um, it's just illustrating how um, nature changes over the year. So the first picture it was very sunny. It looked quite idyllic and peaceful. And then you could probably hear the roaring of the water here. So this is when it's in full flow in winter. And the river does fluctuate throughout the year, you know, depending on snow melt or rainfall. And I just think it's, it's awe inspiring to be able to see this. And this is essentially an outdoor office for me, which is just amazing. Um, so how do you get there? How can you become a countryside ranger? Um, the most important thing is your enthusiasm for wildlife and conservation and your willingness to learn. So I, I never stop learning. You know, I might learn some new practical techniques like using new tools or constructing um, a new piece of infrastructure. And also when I'm out um, doing patrols and looking at the nature reserve, I might see plants that I've never seen before. So, you know, there's always an opportunity to challenge yourself and learn more. So that's really, really good for us. Um, as everyone said before, 
get experience anywhere you can. There's different places you can volunteer. I volunteered with um, Glasgow City Council Countryside Rangers, also Glasgow City Council itself, and different projects at university. Um, and there's lots of citizen science projects you can get involved with. And um, so things you might have heard of like the RSPB Big Bird Watch, and then there's also Squirrel Survey as well. And um, so just have a look because these are really good ways of improving your ID skills, but also you like your wildlife monitoring skills, and you don't need necessarily need any equipment to do this either. Just you know a pair of eyes and um, access to the internet usually. Um, so starting your journey, you might have an end goal. Um, a particular place that you want to work or a particular job you want to be in, but you might need to go through a few steps to get there. So maybe think about where you're going to begin, like long term volunteering placement or with a temporary seasonal position. Um, qualifications are important, but there's different sorts of qualifications. Um, I had a very academic degree in zoology um, I really, really enjoyed it, but there are other practical um, based qualifications as well, for example, like an HND and countryside management. Next one, please. Thank you. And um, so some things that I wish I knew about when I was thinking about my career. Um, all I knew was that I wanted to work with animals. I had no idea about the job that I could do with a degree in zoology. I was just focused on learning about animals and I did really love it, but it wasn't as practically based as I needed for a job as a countryside ranger. Um, so I, what I wish I would have done was have taken some time before going on to university or college and just working in a job, saving up some money and having a real think about, um, you know, exploring different jobs that were available and also looking into different courses in more detail because in hindsight, it would have made more sense for me to do an HND in countryside management. Um, so then I ended up sp spending some time um, gaining practical skills through volunteering, as I mentioned before. And um, volunteering is such a great way of learning new skills and learning about yourself. Um, you know, and working out, is, is this really the path for me? And you meet new people and you can end up in all sorts of different places. Um, so five years on um, into my career with Scottish Wildlife Trust, you know, I've realised that this is the place I want to be. Um, every day has been interesting and, you know, it's always been rewarding. So I would say, um, you know, find something that you enjoy doing and that you're passionate about and you'll get there in the end. And thanks for listening. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Claire. And I think that's a really good point. Money doesn't make you happy, but doing something you enjoy will. And it's absolutely true. Uh, and it's something to think about because jobs in the conservation sector don't pay as much as other jobs that you might get elsewhere but you're spending every day doing something you love and it's you know so rewarding and probably more important um so thank you very much for that we had a poll during your talk which was would you enjoy practical work and 91 percent of you would enjoy practical work which is absolutely brilliant and uh we didn't have anyone say no we had nine percent say they don't know yet which is totally fine because you might not have had a go at it yet um brilliant that's perfect for for conservation if you're willing to give practical work a go that'll set you up well fantastic we have now finished all our presentations to, for today thank you so much to everybody who who has joined us and, and given a presentation i would like to now uh take part in the second q a session so i know we've overrun but if you have asked some questions and you'd like to hang around we will do this next q a um so please do stay with us if you can um i'll hand over to joe for the next 10 or 15 minutes or so just to go through some of those questions thanks very much catherine so i'll try and finish um by half past um if that's okay with you catherine uh, partly because i'm supposed to be in another meeting but uh, I think they, they understand that this one is far more interesting and important. So um, there's a couple of questions here about how to discover volunteering opportunities. I would suggest uh, go to Volunteer Scotland's website, just Google 
Volunteer Scotland, um, and there's lots of opportunities there. Um, th at the top, the, the question that is very popular, we touched on this before, you know, about the fact that it's very difficult in a pandemic to find volunteering opportunities, um, is the advice to wait. I would say don't wait, just, just go and see what's out there, but equally don't worry if you can't find something now, something will come up. Um, again, you might want to just take some action more locally if there's not a volunteering opportunity to hand. For those of you asking questions about volunteering specifically with the Trust, but also asking questions about reserves in specific areas, go onto our website. Um, equally, apprenticeships, we haven't got any apprenticeships at the moment, but they would always be advertised. Um, anything paid would be advertised on the Trust's website. Um, I wanted to pick up on a specific question to Ali um, based on his presentation. So uh, six people would like to know, how did Ali find studying marine biology at Stirling and what skills are useful for applying? So Ali. Uh, yeah, um, so I found studying marine biology at Stirling really useful. It was really good. Um, I will say the course was updated the year after I left, so it's a bit different now, but everything that I've heard from people that I met during it that were in years prior, uh, under me, the, um, the course has been developed and it's it's better than it was when I was there and it was good when I was there. It's a lot more practical and stuff now and there's a lot more focus on getting out and actually looking at um, marine environments and stuff. So I would suggest Sterling, it's a, it's a good course and it's a good uni, it's a really nice uni as well. Um, Any specific um, and skills, Ali? What, what, what specific skills do you think might help people successfully apply? Um, yeah, so like just um, so if you're able to get out and visit the coast, um, just getting out and showing that you've got that sort of knowledge of um, the Scottish coast as well is really important. Making sure it's like um, so that it's like practical and they know that you've got an interest and in stuff. Um, specific skills, yeah, get, yeah, get out and practice your like ID, get some basic ID skills on. Um, what might you find in a rocky shore and things like that. There's loads of useful ID guides on the Trust website and on other websites and stuff. And just try and build up that knowledge, just show that you've got that passion for this sort of marine environment. Um, and then they, they, yeah, take it from there. And I think that's a really important one, just to show you've got some um, like a basic idea of what it's about in the sort of environment you were getting involved in. Brilliant. Thanks, Ali. I, I think that that also links quite nicely to one of the other questions that was asked about which is more important, education or experience. And I would say they're both important because they're both ways of demonstrating what you can bring to a job and, and showing that that passion, that determination, the skills, the, the knowledge that you'll you'll gain. Um, I'm going to throw it open to all the panel uh, panel members in a minute just to have a um, think about um, this one, how do you use your work and research to combat climate change? So I'll just give panellists a moment to think about that um, before we wrap up. But uh, whilst they're doing so, let me just cover two or three other questions. So what career options would come from studying environmental science at university? I think the thing is there, you know, you might end up in a, a charity like the Scottish Wildlife Trust, but equally you could end up in a government agency like the Scottish Environment Protection Agency or Nature Scott. Equally, you could end up in an um, environmental consultancy or you might end up in a, a big business like a, um, a utility company that, that owns lots of land and so on. So that's covering that one. A um, couple of other people had asked about, do you need a degree? Uh, no, you don't. Um, lots of our jobs don't require a degree, but even if we do require a degree, we always say or equivalent experience. So that's worth uh, thinking about. So um, open to the panellists. Who would like to come in um, on the question about climate change? Catherine. Thanks, Joe. Um, yes, I, as a communicator, um, my uh, involvement in trying to do something about climate change in terms of professionally and, and in my day to day job is that I'm trying to communicate to people uh, and our members and our volunteers why climate change is a is an issue and then the things that they can do to help us to try and combat it. And so we, me personally, it's largely working with members of the public and very often children. And we have ways of communicating it to even very young audiences. Um, and I think the benefit at the moment with, with how much media attention there is, particularly um, among young people, they're very aware of climate change as an issue. And there is a momentum out there that we're able to um, tap into and work with. And that's really positive. And we're doing that more and more in our day-to-day -day job as educators. Um, so that's really good. And then I'd say the other part of the trust that we're kind of involved with a little bit is the policy work um, that goes on for climate change and nature-based solutions. 
um, and trying to, again, get people to um, write to their politicians, get involved with our advocacy work uh, to directly try and try and make positive changes that will help with that issue. Thanks, Catherine. And uh, that, that word nature based solutions uh, is a really important one this year, and especially as Glasgow is going to host the, um, the UN, the United Nations Climate Summit later in the year. So do go and Google nature based solutions uh, and put that into our website and you'll find much more information. You've already heard from Sarah about the importance of peatlands for locking up massive amounts of carbon, um, but also trees and soil and the marine environment. Um, and and uh, it can help us to adapt to climate change as well. Did anybody else want to quickly chip in on climate change? Um, well, I, I was just going to say, um, yeah, Sarah can probably talk about peatlands, but on our reserves, we manage our reserves um, for biodiversity, but when we're managing for biodiversity, for example, by tree planting or managing deer, um, when the numbers are too high, that all helps um, to combat climate change as well, because it's making our reserves um, better at carbon storage. Brilliant. No, thanks, Michelle. And it, yeah, that's a massively um, important part of our work. So I'm aware that we've probably um, more or less run out of time. I'm sure that we could go on for very, very much longer, especially with so many questions. Um, Catherine, shall I hand back to you to yes, close the you. event? Uh, I've certainly really enjoyed all of the questions and presentations. Thanks so much, Joe, and thanks for sticking around even when uh, we, we've overrun and gone into your other meeting. Thank you so much. Uh, brilliant questions. Thank you, everybody who has uh, suggested a question today. Thank you to all our panellists for your presentations and your amazing answers to those questions. Um, if you would like to uh, send us a question and it didn't get answered today, send it into um, the email address that was on the event information. That's my email address and we'll try and answer those for you if you didn't get answered in the event. Um, and we've got one more poll for you on the screen before you go, which is, have you found today useful? And the people who have voted so far have said uh, yes or they don't know, which is brilliant. So thank you very much. Thank you to everyone. Um, have a lovely weekend and good luck. Best of luck with your future careers. Keep in touch with us. Volunteer with us. We hope to see you in the future. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>